Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, I wonder if you all remember this. Love, love you blue. You know that we do. We'll always be true, because we love you blue. Yes, we love you blue. Uh, I remember the blue shirts and the hats and everything uh, that we, in that year of 1979, dawned to show our support of the Houston Oilers. Now, for some of you, you may not know this, but Bum Phillips put together a team in that year, 1979, upon the foundations of Alvin Bethea. Don, Dan Pastorini and Ken Burrow, remember those guys. And so he had begun to, to build up by using talent and bringing in new folks like Gifford Nielsen, Mike Renfro, Earl Campbell, all of them that would lead in that year to an unexpected championship game. And we were so excited. The 1979 Super Bowl between the Pittsburgh Steelers, boo, and uh, Houston was an opportunity like no other, leading the game until the lack of, you remember this, I see Esther nodding, between the lack of a touchdown uh, that caused the loss, a disputed ruling. I was watching the film the other day to remind myself, I still think we had it. Houston, though, lost with humility. When they returned to Houston in the Astrodome, there were a few Love You Blue fans in the parking lot waving those blue pom-poms. Remember the blue pom-poms? And the Oilers, though, were heartbroken and sad. And the driver continued to navigate through the parking lot, pulling into the stadium, and there, as these losers returned home, was an Astrodome filled with Houstonians. And they were cheering and loving on their football team. It's actually something to watch. Watch again. Uh, uh, People were yelling and singing Love You Blue and throwing toilet paper rolls. Uh, uh, And the Oiler team, you listen to them comment, they were just stunned by this event. They had been defeated, but they were loved. They lost, but they were loved. They failed, but they were loved. And in that moment, the people of Houston, I think, revealed a non-cultural norm. Instead, they revealed a gospel norm. They loved a team, the culture would say, that because of their loss did not deserve love and affection or belonging. The norm in our culture is winning, and winning's everything. And if you're not a winner, you're a loser. And if you're a loser, then you should feel shame and unworthy. And we won't be uh, do most anything, I think, to not be a loser. Now, how in the world this came to me this week, I don't really know. But it did come to me in the midst of my prayers and thinking about our passage today about Mary and Elizabeth specifically. And so I want to draw some conclusions about how those two things come together. Mary uh, has accepted God's invitation to be part of the ark of God's love, as we already know from from reading uh, our Bible over the years. And she has gone to Elizabeth's house. And what happens is that Elizabeth loves on her, even though having a child out of wedlock, that this was not good news at the time for any reason. Uh, But both Mary has accepted God's love in this moment and Elizabeth has repeated that love to Mary. Think about how difficult a stance that would have been in the moment, in that historical moment. She loves her, she supports her, and in so doing, 
causes, I believe, a response. God's love and God's love repeated through Elizabeth at this moment to Mary brings Mary to a response where she remembers that God has loved all the people, especially the least and the lost, the broken ones and the sinners, even the ones that have let God down, God has loved. Even the ones who have let others down, God has loved. This God loves on God's people because God, it turns out, loves human beings. Loves all creation but human beings and the sinners and, and the broken ones, perhaps most of all. Of course, later we'll know Jesus. One of the ways they talked about Jesus is he is a friend of sinners, is he not? Mary remembers and repeats in this passage that we heard today, calling upon the words of Hannah's prayer uh, from 1 Samuel, remembers to Elizabeth, and you can imagine this just boiling up in love, that the mighty uh, has done good things in the past and that the mighty one, God, is going to do some good things now. But most especially that God has done this for the lowliest of people, fulfilling the promises of Abraham loving and reconstituting and diversifying God's people the whole way along. God has always reached out uh, in love at the end of the day. Uh, and that this would be, of course, a message for the first Christians who didn't feel a part, but they would read this and hear that God even loved them, though they had not known this tradition uh, or of Jesus themselves. As we meditate upon the meaning of the words of this gospel on this fourth Sunday uh, in Advent, this idea, perhaps imaged in the love for the Houston Oilers who had lost, or maybe uh, as we think about the love God showed to Mary and then Elizabeth repeated for her despite all of the things going against her, we might think about our work. Now, y'all are lucky because I've been preaching on ways of changing our lives for four weeks <laughs> over the last few Sundays. That you get me on the last week, so you don't have four weeks of work to do. You're only going to get one week of work to do. So hallelujah for that. The bishop has come to us with good news. We only have to work on something for a week. But here's what I, I want to, to say to you, that... If you will think of this passage this week, and I'm not asking a whole lot from you. I'm just going to ask that you do one thing. Sometime this week, I believe somebody is going to be put in your path. And this somebody has probably done something wrong. Uh, maybe, they've, maybe they're a child or a grandchild who's misbehaved. Maybe they're, maybe they're a friend or a, 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 a relative who's let you down. Maybe there's somebody who's had a bad experience and just feeling a lot of shame from someplace else. Maybe it doesn't have to do with you at all. But I guarantee that there's going to be one person this week that's going to be put in your path. And I'm just going to ask you to do one thing. Love on them. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for actions that people have. But instead of that being your first response, love on them. Love them. Embrace them. Care for them. Tell them that God loves them. Tell them that they're not, they're not that whatever this is going on in their life, they're not beyond love. No matter what shame they may be feeling at this moment, God doesn't care. God loves you. And bring yourself, this is the discipline part, bring yourself to love on them as well. To say, I love you. I don't know how we'll get through this. I don't know what's going to happen. But I love you enough to keep going. I love you enough to walk with you. If this is something hard at work, something hard they face in the future, you commit to being with them because you love them. Live out Hannah's song. Live out Mary's song. Live out the way the Oilers were received back in Houston after their loss and shame. Now, it's going to be hard. 
Because we're preconditioned in this society to give them something else. Right? So I'm just asking you to put that aside. Now, if you do this, it's a good first step to practicing this the rest of your life. But I'm not asking you to do that. Right now, I'm just asking you to do one. Just find one person. Just see one person. Listen to one person this week. Because if you can do one, you might be able to do two. If you do two, you might be able to do three. Let's not conquer our whole lives. Let's just go a week at a time, okay? The second thing I want to let you know before I end this sermon is that if you will do this, <laughs> this week, just one person this week, you love on them before the judgment and the shame. I promise you Christmas will be different. Christmas will be different. And it'll be different because you will have practiced and experienced what God is doing in the incarnation. What God is doing at the birth of Jesus to show God's love for us. And you all have practiced it and experienced it by loving first. By having that be your first response and first action. I promise that if you will risk what will be uncomfortable, the love in the moment when things are lost, you will know more about God than maybe you have remembered in a long time. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.